realize that this topic is somewhat outside the mainstream of many of, of many of, of people in the audience, so I'll try to be very general and not going into many technicalities. Um, so hadrons have been around for almost a century now since the discovery of the nucleon. So the question is obvious, what makes it an exciting field now? And there have been spectacular new developments both on the accelerator and the, and the detector side and on the theory side. On the accelerator side, we have availability now of using new beam on target possibilities that were not available in the 60s, where this was so at the forefront of high energy physics. <coughs> high intensity photon beams with various degrees of polarization, so J lab, the plus and minus machines with energies that can be tuned to various resonances at heavy quark thresholds at CC bar and BB bar and studying the properties of the decay of heavy flavors. We have new proposals and new experiments on the construction that will be using photon anti photon annihilation at, at, at GSI. We have, of course, LHC, which are going to also is going to LHCB in particular, which is also contributing to the spectroscopy program. On the detector side, and then the possibility of measuring simultaneously very many different reaction decay channels with unprecedented statistics. And I'll show you in a moment, I'm going to show it here, so the evolution of statistics in a particular channel. So this is, this is a spectrum of three pions produced in pion diffraction at rather high energies, anywhere from 20 to 100 GeV. And you see essentially in the, in the 1970s, <laughs> You have something like 100 events per bin, per 10 MeV bins, which goes up to now an experiment called COMPASS, which runs at CERN, essentially four orders of magnitude higher. In the old days, this was called Q1 region and Q2 region, which of course fits sort of close to dark energy and dark matter. Now, even without doing any sophisticated analysis, you can sort of clearly distinguish three resonance peaks. And, and really the, the, the goal of, of hadron physics, in particular partial wave analysis, which is required to, to entangle, disentangle various resonance contributions to really see what happens under these mountains. In particular, look possibly for all tiny signals that clearly would not be seen by just trying to do a bump. So, I mean, the, all the information about hadrons is typically summarized in what's called the particle data book, as of course you all know. If you look at the PDG, you will see something of the order of 300 entries if you look both of mesons and baryons. Now, I would say 90% of the entries which have to do with light core hadrons have really been established or really been first detected in the experiment that ran in the 60s and 70s. So for a period of, of last 20 or 30 years, there really hasn't been much on the light core hadron spectroscopy. And again, it is in the last 10 or so years, as I said, with the development of new experimental techniques and new theoretical developments, we, are the, the, we have now the possibility to really uncover what the spectrum looks like. And so as I said, out of these, as I wrote here, out of this 300 or so entries, we think we really know only a handful. And, and I will show you later one of the so sort of fundamental resin Hadron resonances, which is sort of the hadronic version of the Higgs boson, the sigma meson, has, its properties have only been pinned down in the last five or so years. Again, through a combination of new, new data coming, uh, coming along and new analysis. Techniques. Now, on the theoretical side, we have lattice. I mean, lattice has now been developed to the state that it's really becoming possible to determine not just the ground state properties of hadrons, but also whole powers of excited states. So we are at the situation where, on the experimental side, we already see new particles, new hadrons. You probably all remember the story of the pentaquark, which sort of was a singularity to some, to some extent. But now, indeed, we, well, we don't see the pentaquarks, but we, uh, I will show you, we do see hadrons, which certainly don't fit our theoretical <coughs> expectations. On the other side, Lattice is also predicting now, with very high accuracy, existence of hadrons that have not been observed. So we, we, we are at the, at, the, at the stage that we really can now make a realistic progress trying to match experiment and theory. And I'll, I'll be illustrating one and the other. 
Um, so, of course, again, the goal, you know, there is the whole as well, other aspect of Hadron spectroscopy, which has to do more with Hadron structure. There's a new class of observables that have been proposed and very carefully studied on the theoretical side that essentially generalize the notion of positron distributions to a whole new dimension. So one, uh, there are new, new, new techniques, theoretical techniques that, that, that enable people to understand that it's indeed possible to disentangle various multi-dimensional distributions of quarks. But again, I'm not going to, this is a whole new talk, so I'm not going to be touching on that much. I'll be focusing primarily on spectroscopy. So again, from the point of a spectroscopy, you want, if you want to address using hadron masses and, 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 and decay properties to understand what is it made from, we're really asking the question of how the hadron looks like from the point of view of quarks and gluons. And of course, we'd like to have some intuition our intuition, however, is very limited when it, when it has to when, when it has to describe a world which is well, of the size of the, of the of the proton, where quarks and gluons move through the speed of light, and the forces with which they bind uh, of the overton. Now, this certainly is far outside the domain of what I'd say traditional nuclear physics, where protons and neutrons are fairly well identified objects as they make uh, heavier. Quarks and gluons are much more difficult to visualize in a sense. So just a, a few words of introduction for mainly for the students. And particles are emergent phenomena. So when we talk about what quark and gluons are, we first think about three quarks and gluons. And three quarks and gluons, of course, nothing else but phonons of the ether, uh, excitations of coupled harmonic oscillators, and this is what we call three or, or bare. Uh, particles, quarks, gluons, electrons, photons, and so on. Now, as we add interactions to this simple harmonic oscillator, which is just a field theory, well, depending on what the interaction is, if we're lucky and the interaction is weak, like in, in QED, then of course what happens is that the physical electron is not much different from the very one. The, the corrections can be calculated using the derivative expansion. So the physical electron yes, has, the, has the three part and, and a little bit of a photon cloud surrounding it. Now in QCD, again, if, if E represents here the electromagnetic charge, natural units, then the QCD charge is about 10 times bigger. Of course, we know that it depends on the distance at which the quarks interact. But fortunately or unfortunately, in the region of interest where they are sitting inside the hadrons, which is on this side, they, indeed the interaction strength is, is, is big. And, and all these standard perturbative techniques we can throw out of the window. And in principle, the physical quark, physical quark has nothing to do compared to where the very quark, I mean, the, the whatever happens can be very complicated uh, dynamical process. And so this is an illustration of what might be happening. The point is that the nonlinear interaction is added to the simple harmonic oscillator, so it should dominate the physics. Since this is a nonlinear theory, even at the classical level, we expect there to be uh, the topological solutions, solitons, monopoles, instantons, etc., etc., which, in which, 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 in which now the physical residual quarks and gluons propagate. So you can imagine again a picture in which quarks, the physical ones, are some sort of blobs which emerge from dressing the very quarks with, as they interact with this with this complicated medium. The, the medium itself is of course dynamically generated from the gluons. And on top of that, there can be some residual degrees of freedom of the gluons, which contribute in the, in the, to the spectrum of, of the dark state. Now, surprisingly, for reasons which are still not understood, the good old-fashioned quark model seems to work. Now, it is, it is certainly true that it works very accurately when it has to do with heavy quark content. CC bar states, BB bar states. So this is not necessarily to scale, but, but the discrepancies are all of the others. So this is a scale of, of 3 to 4 GB. Uh, again, the, 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 the discrepancies here of the order of maybe of the order of 20 or so MEVs. So, so the levels here represent sort of the standard prediction of essentially a QQ bar model, which is nothing else than transposing a positronium spectrum uh, to, to different energy region. And the dots represent the states that have been measured. And as I said, they fit exceptionally well, the predicted quark model spectrum, even above the decay threshold. So here, this is, the, this is 
all the higher the case threshold, the lower the case threshold leads to the DD bar meson, the D meson is a charmed quark and a light quark. So if this is a charmonium, the first thing that can indicate is a pair of D mesons. So even, even about the, D, the decay channel, the quark model is still, the decays don't seem to break the quark model uh, dynamics. Now, of course, if this was it, there wouldn't be much left to be discussed. So I would say this is, this, yes, this to some extent provides a starting template. But there are a lot of unexpected states that have already popped out, as again, both of the experiments <coughs> and also the theoretical calculations of the lattice are predicting states which certainly do not fall this, into, this, into this picture. So, again, as I said, with handles, uh, we are sort of trying to see if, if it's possible to isolate, to, to distinguish hadrons in, in the following sense. That, that some of them really look not much different as excitations of pion or, or a proton, namely it's just the same quark type counting number of quarks plus something else. And if that something else is really excitations of the gluon field, for example, then by studying those, the spectrum of that excitation, we should be able to learn something about confinement. Now it is possible, of course, that two hadrons have the quarks and hadrons and uh, quarks and gluons and hadrons have already neutralized their colors. But just like in, in, in the atomic nuclei, there's a residual force between these color neutral objects that still provides additional binding and can, can lead to different type of patterns which look more like a deuteron, like hadronic molecules, essentially. So I will, I will show you examples that fall into one and the other category. So going back to, to really understanding QCD, the fundamental uh, question that we, or the fundamental uh, issue that we want to understand is, is what about confinement? Now, confinement, it's, it's typically phrased as absence, as absence of physical quarks in the spectrum, but this is just one part of it. Now, if this was it, one could not actually distinguish confinement from the Higgs mechanism. I mean, Higgs mechanism essentially is, is, is just dressing. Suppose you have an electron in an electron plasma, and of course, electrons going, the charge is going to be screened, and you won't see the physical electron. And this is nothing else but Higgs mechanism. So if it was it, there would be no necessary distinction between confinement and the Higgs space. Mm -hmm. So there's a question. Now, unfortunately, there is, there is no other parameter which can distinguish confined phase from deconfined phase. Because in a different confined quarter and plasma, of course, there has to be local color somewhere in space. And this is not a gauge invariant quantity. So there's no fundamentally other parameter that one can use to distinguish one phrase from another. So one tends to look at other aspects of spectrum, for example, which, which clearly are different in theory, which is which we expect to be confined like UCD versus a theory which is, which is screened like, like a Higgs theory. And here is a list that sort of has been more or less agreed as, as summarizing what really manifestation of confinement should, should be, be related to. Linearizing potential. Now, of course, this is a theoretical construct because linearizing linear potential means that the force, we're talking about force between static quarks. We don't have static quarks. So, again, it's something that one can simulate on the lattice and see if, if QC confined in that sense. Radio trajectories, this is, of course, prehistory, but this is, this is a, an absolute essential tool in hadronic physics nowadays is to understand radio trajectories. Again, radio trajectories linearly. Rising ledger trajectories to infinity would be a manifestation of confinement. And one particular dynamical realization of linear rising trajectories is, of course, a rigid rudder, relativistic rigid rudder, which produces an infinite number of states. I'll give us an illustration of that. And indeed, known hadrons do fall fairly well on linear rising ledger trajectories. And again, these two other are also related to properties, so sort of theoretical properties of, of the QCD force causing an analytic state or not going into details. And of course, string behavior. If, if confinement is driven by some sort of chromoelectric field of, the, of gluons, then that field can also get excited and, and, and give string type excitation at some point. But it's not, but again, the, the transition between, between, between sort of small strings, as you, as you wish, to think about it, and, and, and long strings, that's sort of what goes under this acronym of Casimir and analogy scaling and so forth. If anybody has questions, we can discuss it later. Now, what would be the microscopic mechanism for confinement? And this is, again, an old idea, which goes back to works by Mandelstam, Koft, and Polyakov, 
and it seems to be very well supported in lattice calculations. And it's an idea that essentially QCD vacuum acts like a dual superconductor. So in the normal superconductor, so summarized on the left here and the dual and summarized on the right, in the normal superconductor there is a condensate of electric charge of electrons, which, which therefore it's easy to induce permanent electric currents, and if there is a magnetic field in the system, then this magnetic field cannot disappear because this would it's, it's sort of confined by the by the by the electric current uh, of, of, the, of the electron condensate. Now, in the dual superconductor, you change electric to magnetic. So there is there is hypothetical magnetic chromomagnetic condensate in the QCD vacuum, which leads to magnetic currents, which therefore confine electric fluxes. So these electric fluxes would here be attached at the ends, for example, to static quarks. This would be all submerged in a condensate of, magnet, of, of magnetic monopoles, for example, magnetic vortices, and this would sta stabilize the, the electric flux. Now, where would magnetic monopoles in QCD come from? Well, they do exist in QCD because QCD is a nonlinear theory. So, in the classical solutions of nonlinear Young Mills equations, have monopole like solutions. Now, they have, unfortunately, at the classical level, they are, they are quite singular at short distances, but we know how to handle short distances. There will be quantum fluctuations. Which, which probably screen the short distance course of the monopoles. So, in the, again, in lattice simulations, it is fairly straightforward to identify monopole like configurations. And if in the lattice calculation you can identify monopole like configurations, you can also remove them from Monte Carlo simulation from calculation of observables, and then you see that a confinement disappears. So, that's how, uh, that's how it, is, it, is, it is believed to be a reasonable uh, confinement scenario. Now, before this is being established, uh, fairly well, because of course there's still a lot of debate whether this, what is exactly the nature of monopoles, if it's sort of Dirac type monopoles, whether this is the monopoles which are responsible, or whether this is the strings that are connected to the monopoles which are responsible. This is still under, under the discussion. But you may remember that the, the old idea about confinement is that it would be possible to essentially think of confinement by generalizing the, 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 the interaction between electric charges to the uh, to, to the, the color field, namely, so I should generalize the idea of a one photon exchange to one gluon exchange, possibly dressing the gluon because of interactions with the medium, dressing the way the gluon interacts with external charges. And this has been essentially ruled out by lattice now. So what's shown here is, what, in order for this, this mechanism work, to work, what should happen is that the, as the gluon propagates at large distances, it should be enhanced. The, I mean, the, the probability of gluon propagating a large distance should be large, so it provides a large force between the quarks. At the level of a lattice observable, which is this green function, this would correspond to this, this quantity rising here at small, at small distances, in this case momentum, at small momentum, at large distances, as 1 over p squared. And lattice calculation clearly show that this thing is saturated. Essentially, gluons become massive as opposed to be confined. So it is this, this single or few body type uh, model of confinement is essentially being ruled out by, by, by other simulations. And this many body picture where you need a condensate of some sort of magnetic charges in the right image, so it seems to be, seems to be more, much more robust. So there's this dual role of gluons. Again, if you, if you think of gluons, there's a way of formulating QCD which, which is very similar to quantum electrodynamics, namely, there is a kinetic term. For quarks, there's kinetic term for gluons in the Hamiltonian. There is an analog of a Coulomb potential between color charges. <coughs> this Coulomb potential becomes very complicated because gluons again couples to themselves. But a, a possible scenario is again this, this, this non-Hamiltonian Coulomb potential is through self-interactions with the magnetic magnetic medium that provides a long-range confining potential between external charges, and then the residual transverse gluons essentially behave like massive particles, which I just showed you through this propagator, and they, in principle, could be similar to what constituent quarks are, or behave in a similar way to constituent quarks. Okay, so again, there are many possibilities in which, in which quarks and gluons can screen their color charge. Of course, the normal variants are, quarks, are three quarks, mesons are quark and an antiquark. Of course, there's a possibility of, of constructing pentaquarks, blue balls, which is just radiation. In this case, it would be just these transverse massive gluons binding together, and hybrid mesons in particular, which, uh, which again, combine both quarks and quark and gluon to disappear. 
So let me discuss some of them. Now, as, as, you, as you know, the, the hybrids, again, the, 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 the states which have, it is difficult to look at states which have pure gluons because they don't have any charge. So it's difficult to poke them with anything external, like silo. They'll be mixing with, with, with states which have, uh, which have no other charge, but are generated by quarks and uh, quarks and non quarks. So, so to, to poke the gluons, so the, the minimal thing that you want to have is quark and an antiquark and the excited gluon around them. And if you combine quantum numbers of, of, of a pair of a quark and an antiquark, you will find that, that, that they only produce a certain set of quantum numbers, namely the spins, parities, and charge communication, just like positronium does. And some of them cannot be generated through, this, through, this, uh, through adding quantum numbers of this quark and quark and antiquark pair. In particular, this one minus plus, as I will show you in a moment, is predicted to be the lightest state in this tower of what I refer to exotic quantum numbers. Again, exotic in the sense that they certainly have to go beyond the core anti core picture of, of mesons. And I'm talking here just about mesons uh, with baryons that are no exotic quantum numbers. Any set of quantum numbers that, that have fermionic degrees of freedom in principle can be constructed from just three quarks. So mesons are unique in that sense. That indeed there is, there is a set of a set of quantum numbers that, that cannot be just uh, described as three quarks. Okay, so what do we know about these exotic exotic states, hybrids? Uh, so here is again sort of an illustration of again. Let me start with lattice calculation. So the first thing that you may want to do is again simulate on the lattice a system which you have two infinitely heavy quark and an anti quark. Let it propagate. So it so whatever the gluons want to do around them eventually will come to the ground state. And you do that for various, at various distances of the quark and anti-quark, and in that way one measures the energy of the quark and anti-quark system as a function of energy, which is basically just the potential between quark and anti-quark. And what you see here is that it's indeed it's long at short distances and it rises linearly, just like expected for, for time. <coughs> but then you can do something more sophisticated. You can, you can form, a, from, from gluons, from a state in which not, not only quark and anti-quark are fixed, they're quantum numbers, but also the links which describe the gluons on the lattice are arranged in such a way that they have symmetries that do not overlap with the symmetries of the gluons in the vacuum. So it's like forming such a diatomic molecule with, with these lines representing gluons. And again, the simulation is carried in such a way that at some point on lattice time, one inserts a state where the, the, the staples form a configuration which cannot overlap with, with ground state, with, 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 with sort of essentially, for example, adding one unit of orbital angular momentum to the system. And if one does this, then one finds this what I call, again, adiabatic excited potential, because now the gluon is explicitly being excited between quark and anti-quark. And the interesting thing that one finds, now of course, if the quarks are then put on top of each other, so the, the distance between goes to zero, now one deals with a system which is called a glue lamp. So it's an octet, octet color source, static color source, and the gluons just lump around. And such is like a hydrogen atom, except that the electron is replaced by the gluon. And what you find in this particular case, now, so, so in this limit, one restores, restores rotational symmetry. The system at finite R has only axial symmetry. So at the, at the, at this, at the symmetry limit, uh, the, the spin parity and charge coordinates are both quantum numbers, and they really determine the spin parity of the all gluon field around this, this static color octet source, and it has one, mi one plus minus quantum numbers. And this is quite unexpected, because if you again think of, if you think of these gluons as, as quasi-particles, just like quarks, they should, behave, they should behave essentially like vector particles. So I have one minus minus quantum numbers, and not one plus, plus minus quantum numbers. This is a very robust identification. This number, there's no question. <coughs> In, in, in this state has a positive parity, not negative parity. So there's some kind of parity inversion, dynamical parity inversion, which makes gluons in a P wave orbital around the static source being lighter than the gluons in the S wave orbital. Now, so this was static quarks, and as I said, the lattice can really do a realistic simulation of, of spectra. So this is this is uh, this is a result from from the, from the J lock lattice collaboration. Joku was featured. Uh, on, on yesterday's beautiful presentation, uh, he was he was talking about hybrids. What you see here on the left is is so sort of, again so so the lines represent the short lines represent the lattice measurements, and and again they fill in perfectly well in the core model template. 
So here is the here is the pan, a QQ bar with with no orbital angular momentum between them, and spin is coupled to spin zero. Here is a row meson where the spins are aligned, and here is the P wave states between quark and an anti-quark, again coupled to either spin zero or spin one, of course, there are four states and the radial excitations and so on. So as I said, this indeed reproduces the quark model spectrum very well. Now, you notice here that, of course, that the, the, this, is, this is done at the quark mass, which is still fairly high, and corresponds to the pion mass, which is about 700 MeV. But, but every time they change the pion mass, starting from charmonium to strange journia to light quarks, which, as I said, are still heavy, and they are trying to do lighter and lighter and lighter, this template remains. On the other hand, they also unambiguously determine there are other states in the spectrum. In particular, there are four states over here, one, one that has this exotic quantum numbers, one minus plus, and it's, and it's put together with three others, which have normal quantum numbers, like, for example, one minus minus, two minus plus, and zero minus plus, which could be just QQ bar states. But what they were able to determine through these simulations is that just like this one has a lot of gluon in their wave function, also these three have a lot of glue in their wave function, except that that glue happened to combine its quantum numbers with the quark and the quark in a normal fashion, and don't produce these exotic quantum numbers. And the same story here, so there's a multiplet of four states, which is identified as having a lot of glue, including one exotic state, and also nine states, sorry, ten states a little bit higher, which have exactly the same problem. So here's sort of a summary, how, how can one get this? So again, if, if, if this picture that we can think of a hybrid, essentially quark anti quark, plus this massive transverse glue on the ground, then we first combine quantum numbers of quark and an anti quark together, parity and charge conjugation. This is orbital angular momentum of spin. Then we add the spin, parity, and charge conjugation of the glue, which, as I showed you before, was determined to be one plus minus, mm -hmm. not one minus plus. And you combine all this together, and again, depending on sort of what is the spin of the quarks in the zero one, you have four states. So it exactly matches, I mean, so the identification of glue as having one plus minus quantum numbers for static quarks in this fully, now, add, now added this to the fully dynamical quark and another quark indeed reproduces the spectrum seen on the lattice, the four lightest hybrid states with a lot of glue. And then the other 10 states that I mentioned, essentially you get by adding one unit of orbital angular momentum to the system, you get 10 states which are corresponding to this one. So it seems like the, the, the lattice not only gives us a robust uh, statement about existence of hybrid mesons, I mean, the signal for these states is as clear as the signal for the rows, for the A2s, and so on and so forth. But it seems like we can also possibly trying to get some phenomenology out of, out of this information and identify, for example, gluons with quasi particles with this sort of inverted parity. And by the way, this, this, this parity inversion, inversion we, we studied years ago and, and, and showed that it, this has to happen in QCD because of this complicated Coulomb potential, which does happen to invert parity of the gluon. Of the okay, so so, so this is, this is one, one story uh, that deals with, with states that have excited, possibly excited glue and therefore can tell us about confinement. Now, in the last few years, there has been a whole plethora of what I call XYZ states, which have been seen in, in various E plus E minus machines. So essentially, they, they contain CC bar because they are running at the, the CC bar threshold. So again, here is, I'm just showing two. The, this Y40 to 60, uh, is, is, is a vector, has a vector uh, quantum numbers. It's, it's well identified to plus and minus annihilation. And if you want to, and it's, its mass is measured at, at, at four, slightly above 4 G. And if you wanted to associate that state with some of the quark model uh, possible slots, there's a problem because the nearest vector state is already occupied by this psi 4160. So there is really no place for this hadron to be. And it might be one of these four states that I showed you before. This multiple of four does contain a vector. So this is a, this is a possible CC bar candidate for hybrid metal. Uh, there is this famous, the, the whole story again, essentially started with the discovery of the X3872, which happens to be very close to the D star D bar threshold. And it's most like candidate, again, for a charm-like version of the deuteron. 
that it's that it's a that it's a loosely bound D star D bar molecule, and that's sort of the, the best theoretical uh, interpretation of what the state is. Again, it's 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 it, its location is the, the nearest available available coordinate of is very far apart, and and again its proximity to the D star D bar threshold makes again this molecular interpretation uh, much more. And, and, and right now, there's, there's a dozen or so states, and I just want to show you uh, that, again, don't fit the, the core model pattern. And then I'm just going to show you one, which is really bizarre, because this is a charged charmonium. Now, CC bar, of course, has to have zero electric charge. So if you measure something which you know contains charm and electric charge, then certainly it's not just a QQ bar state. And this has been seen in, in in two experiments uh, at Bess and at Bell in E plus E minus collision. So E plus E minus, excuse me, E plus E minus, in this case, E plus E minus energy is tuned, has been tuned to run at this Y uh, 40 to 60, because again, it, it's been known before, and so, so the proposal was to study properties of the 40 to 60, so, so that's the center of mass energy. And then whatever it's created decays into two pi on seven J psi. And then if you look at the invariant mass distribution of pi plus and j psi, or also pi minus and j psi, you see the same. What I'm plotting here is pi plus j psi. You see this peak in both experiments. And well, as, as, as you may know, I've been always a very strong skeptic about the pentachord. I'm still a skeptic here, but, but I don't know. I cannot, I, it's, it's something is going on here that, 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 it's, that it's not well understood. OK. so. Uh, so we, 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 are, we, are, we are now indeed seeing these many different hadrons uh, that, that, well, on one hand side, it's good. We have a template that we can refer to the core model template. On the other side, we're only seeing signs for life outside the core model template. So how can we, from, from experimental observ observation, we can make more robust determination whether these things outside of the core model template indeed have different structure than what well, the fourth model would be. And, and one, one way to look at it is, is, again, to try to see what kind of regular trajectories these new particles lie on. I was telling you, the regular trajectory is, I mean, it's not something that it's, that it's taught in classes very often, but regular trajectory is a very, contains very detailed information about the underlying dynamics. So, so by linking resonances of various spins and masses is by, by continuous lines. These lines really are unique for depending on what the underlying dynamics is that produces these resonances. And I was just alluding to the linear rising trajectories as, for example, trajectories which reflect linear confinement. And then depending what the trajectory is curved, what's the imaginary part of the trajectory, one can make further, further uh, distinction between different dynamical mechanisms that produce patterns. So for example, most hadrons, most resonances, you indeed see like on perfectly linear trajectories, which again sort of support this quark model linear confinement uh, mechanism. But many of them now, including the sigma meson, which of course I'm sure everybody knows, it was originally proposed as, as a mediator of the medium range attraction in the NN potential. Uh, and then of course you want to interpret this in terms of some more fundamental degrees of freedom. So the most likely possibility was just a correlated to pion system. And it's been difficult to identify sigma meson experimentally as a resonance. And, it's, and it happened only not as I said long ago, where the location of the sigma meson resonance pole on the complex energy plane of the, of the scattering output has been determined to a precision, which I think is unprecedented when it comes to determination of widths and masses of resonances. So it's known to something like Q percent. And then if you do so, this regular trajectory analysis of the sigma meson, you find that the trajectory upon, regular trajectory upon the sigma meson lives is very different from the normal regular trajectories. It's much flatter and essentially doesn't have any other resonances on its tail, which looks more, much more like a molecular state, essentially something which is bound by Kalatai potential, so some residual force between two pions mm -hmm. in the sigma meson. Um, I have two minutes, so um, I, I think I, I should be pretty much on time. Uh, so how are we hunting for, for resonance? So let me just say a few words about 
uh, resonance uh, uh, have no resonance programs associated with, with JLAP. So JLAP is going to be looking for uh, primarily meson resonances using a fixed target experiment. So high energy beam, in this case photon coming in, at high, at hitting, uh, say, proton target. Then what happens is that if the beam comes at high energy, it doesn't really destroy the target itself. It scatters on the meson cloud of hadrons around the target. So there is a, there is a factorization between beam fragments and target fragments. If one is interested in baryon uh, resonances, one would study the fragmentation of the target. If one is interested in identifying mesons, one would be studying fragmentation of the, of the, uh, of the beam. And, and if, we, if you ch exchange photon by pion, this is, this is the program of, of the compass experiment itself. So then, then one looks at this, at this, at this uh, beam fragmentation region, and the, and the question there is, as always, is, it, is this a signal or is it a background? Now, it's, it's important to remember that there are no arbitrary backgrounds in QCD. Everything has to be coming from the same degrees of freedom, so the same patterns and the same quarks and gluons. So what's typically referred to as a background is really a force. It's really the same type class of resonance that can be produced directly. Those resonance, when exchanged in sort of cross channels, that produce backgrounds or residual interactions. So it's really about understanding particle force duality when it comes to ex extracting information about directly produced resonance in harmonic environments. Now, if I have maybe just one minute, this goes back to, again, early 60s, and the idea of bootstrap, and I like to quote here from Chu's paper. Uh, this is 1962. Well, this is mine naming, bootstrap manifesto. Because, <laughs> because if, you, if, you, if you read just the introduction, he says, I mean, this is the optimistic that strong theory, strong interaction are going to be solved in the next few years, essentially. Uh, the relative shock period of time we are going to achieve a deeper depth of understanding of strong interaction that a few years ago uh, was, was not expected. I'm bursting with excitement. Well, we're also bursting with excitement 50 or so years ago. Uh, so what went wrong? Well, they realized this particle force duality, but they, they thought that, indeed, all the particles are Indeed, dual, everything, everything that strong interactions say about are just hadrons. So from the exchanges of hadrons, you can dynamically generate hadrons produced in the direct channel. So there was nothing more fundamental than hadrons. And this was a mistake, because of course they didn't realize that there are more fundamental objects, quarks and gluons. So, so the, the bootstrap program failed because dynamically you cannot really generate quark physics from hadron physics. But on the other hand, it provided us all the necessary tools for disentangling forces or backgrounds from directly produced resonances, which is, as I said, needed to extract the resonance figure from signals from the experiment. And again, oh, so this follows works from people like Mandelstam and as I said, Reger, to provide all the analytical machinery uh, that now we can use to do this. And here is just an illustration. I'm almost finished. Here is just an illustration of what, what was happening again 70 years ago when people were trying to do this program. So again, I'll show you this, this spectrum before. Uh, there is this a, a, um, a, there's an A1 resonance here, which is, which is shown sort of to this shoulder. And this is how, this is how the extraction of the A1 looked like uh, in, this, in, this, in, in, the, in this year. And you see, this doesn't even really look like a resonance. So, so it was unclear whether this is, again, a background effect and a force effect, a directly produced resonance effect. This is with high statistics how the signal looks like. It's a perfectly well-produced resonance. So again, these things are not additive. It's, it's either background, which reproduce of this, which should be responsible for these high tails, or other resonances. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the matching of the two which, which constrain the resonance interaction. So I'll skip this, just put the last slide here. So, so you, you may heard the JLAC is taking a new initiative to try to synergize all the effort necessary to, to really push the hadronic physics to the precision, which is now required given the huge amount of and the very high precision data we will have available from JLAP and also other experiments, and so synergize all the activities in the US and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, outside, and outside the world to make sure that we understand QCD and hopefully, well, I'm not going to give you the timeline. A few years. Thank you. Uh, You, you mentioned the, 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 the 
discussion of this 3872. 30, there's, there's also the, the equivalent or similar ones at 10 GB. Correct. The, by the bottom part. Correct. There is. The, the, I, I mean, mentioned there was a lot of rumor about that last year. Yes. There is, there is one or two that are, well, the, the reason why I specifically highlighted the X and the Y and the Z is because out of the about dozen or so of these X, Y, Zs, these three are really the only ones that have been conferred, that have been seen by more than one expert. Yeah, sure. You mean whether they can look at variables? Yes. Um, and, if, and what is the limitation? Is it because the 12 GB cap on the energy, or what? I believe it's the detectors. It's the, um, the detectors are optimized to essentially study the forward fragmentation. <laughs> so, so at the time, by the time the 12 GB program was proposed, this was the main focus. So that's how the class, sorry, the glue detector and also the, the, the additions to the, the class detector, the program the class detector focuses more on the spectroscopy, on the, on the structure side that I have not discussed, GPDs, TMDs, pattern distributions. Then uh, there is there's also a spectroscopy program, but again, because of how the class 12 detector has already been designed, designed this, the, the spectroscopy program, the, 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 the new detector components that are added to the class 12 detector Again, focus more on the forward direction. So it's it's more it will be that we're using a complementary techniques to blue X to look at again forward uh, forward fragmentation. Okay. And and if I may, again the main reason for focusing on the forward region mainly mesons is because with mesons you do have this un unambiguous possibility of exotic quantum numbers, which with baryons of course it will be a more complicated to unambiguous. But to get to the Instrument. Instrument. And we're looking at the So, any questions? So, I mean, so how far can, can we push the orbital to a spin triplet uh, representation? Into excited states, for instance, L different from Y? So, we have the higher L values and then. This, again, if, if you refer to Laos. Yes. Um, I guess that's what uh, you see here essentially lattice is at the moment capable of identifying states which cover essentially up to B wave excitations. Okay. Now the reason the reason why why there is a limitation is again because cubic symmetry is quite different than, than the spherical symmetry. Mm -hmm. So identifying unambiguously states which have high orbital angulment becomes more and more difficult to identify those states. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again.